Hey everyone, it's question show time. Your questions, my answers. Wherever you are, anywhere on my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. Uh, just one quick little piece of housekeeping. For those of you who watch all our various live stream stuff, we're about to go into our summer hiatus and this is when we stop doing all of our live shows, but we're still gonna be producing question shows and, and other experiments. It's sort of a chance for me to, to keep doing work, but without having to make sure that I can find my way to internet, a, a high quality internet stream every single week, multiple times. I'm kind of tied to my bandwidth. So this is a chance to be able to go and do more adventures and experiments and, and do stuff. So. Um, if Astronomy Cast, Weekly Space Hangout, and Open Space, they all will wrap up and they will all be back in September. So if you're watching this and you're wondering why all that content isn't coming out, that's why. All right, let's get into the questions. Sean Sarmast. Hey Fraser, we often see images of the Milky Way that are really just artistic renderings, but how well do we know what it actually looks like? Even our neighborhood stars are usually given locations within several light years. Thanks. Yeah, any photograph that you've seen of the Milky Way face on is an artist illustration or it's of another galaxy. We obviously, we are trapped inside the Milky Way and we can't take a picture of what it looks like from the outside. You have to fly hundreds of thousands of light years out into space to be able to do that and we can barely get out to Pluto. Uh, so in order to figure out what the Milky Way really looks like, what astronomers do is they study the distribution of gas and stars around us in all directions and try to piece out what is a spiral arm? What is a gap between spiral arms? How many spiral arms and how are they configured? Does the Milky Way have a central bar or do the spiral arms come right into the middle? And now it sort of looks like the Milky Way probably has some kind of central bar and then the spiral arms extend outward from there. And then from there you just look out into space and you can find example galaxies that are similar to that. And that's the best that we can do until we can build our warp drive. End. 3R147. How can I tell satellites apart from planes at night? Last time I saw this dot move across the sky from horizon to horizon at a very high pace of speed. It wasn't a blinking light, but never having seen a satellite, I was questioning myself. That sounds to me like you saw the International Space Station, which is the brightest object in the night sky after the, after the sun and the moon. Uh, the International Space Station is actually brighter than Venus, so it's very easy to see. And it can often surprise you, and especially during the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, we'll see the International Space Station sometimes pass by a couple of times a night. And that's because in the summer for the Northern Hemisphere, it's like the space station is flying high enough that it's illuminated for its entire pass. If it wasn't the space station, it was probably some other bright, satellite. But unless you're in fairly dark skies, you probably won't see any other satellites than the International Space Station. Airplanes, as you said, they usually have a blinking light, so you can sort of tell from that. And if you actually look at them in a telescope, they produce like three lines through your photograph. There's the lights in the beginning and the aft, and then two different lights on the ends of their wings, and they make this really obvious streak through your photographs, and they're really obnoxious to have to remove from your pictures. So, I think you saw the International Space Station. Machine Gun 20. Fraser, first off, I absolutely appreciate every piece of content from you online. How big is the team behind you, though, and who are these incredible people? Yeah, I don't do this work alone. I've got a team. Uh, there's my lovely wife, who's working the camera right now. Hi. <laughs> Um, there's Chad, who is the editor uh, for all of the videos that we do. So he's the one who figures out all the content, all the cool video scenes to show for the Guide to Space videos, and he edits these together as well. If some picture shows up while I'm talking, that'll be Chad's fault. Um, and then over on the Universe Today side, we have our writing team. So there's, um, there's Matt Williams, there's Evan Goff, there's Dave Dickinson, there's Nancy Atkinson, um, Bob King, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some other people. So we've got a, a handful of writers over on, and many people have been with us over time and have moved on to other projects, and you might see them over at space.com or at Discovery. It's sort of a fairly small community, but so it's me, my wife, Chad, and uh, the and the writers on Universe Today. And then we have additional people who work on 
production for some of the other projects, like on the Weekly Space Hangout, of course, there's my co-host on that. We've got Nancy Graziano, who does a lot of our production. We've got uh, Susie Murph, and of course, Dr. Pamela Gay assisting me on Astronomy Cast. And then we've got other co-hosts who show up at, from time to time. But so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big team. And of course, that's why we have Patreon, so that I can write everybody's paychecks. So thank you. Satura, how big would a meteorite impact have to be on the moon so that we could easily see it with the naked eye? There was this mystery in astronomy for a long time where people would be looking at the moon, especially in a telescope, and then they would see this flash. And they didn't know what it was. It was called a transient lunar phenomena. And now we know that what these are is asteroids, meteors, smacking into the moon and releasing a tiny bit of energy uh, or light and a lot of energy as they collide with the moon. And we had this great example of this during the last lunar eclipse. One of these happened and everybody happened to have their telescopes pointing at the moon at the time. And so we saw this, this little flash that happened. After that, astronomers went to work to try and figure out how big that thing was. And it was about one to two feet across and it carved out a crater that was about a dozen meters across. So that you wouldn't have seen with your unaided eye, although maybe some people did. And that was about say half a meter across. So you would probably need something that was a couple of meters across, you know, a rock that's maybe know, six feet across to smash into the moon that you would be able to see with your unaided eye. And they happen from time to time. You just have to be looking at the moon all the time, especially when it's a new moon. And so you'll see the illumination when the collision happens. Master Pack, could you simply paint Starlink satellites black around the main part so they don't reflect much light back? After the first launch of the 60 space Starlink satellites, uh, Elon Musk said that he was going to do a bunch of work to try and figure out how to minimize their brightness in the sky. And I've heard this suggestion a bunch of times, which is why don't you just paint them black? And painting them black would absolutely make them a lot less reflective. If you lower the albedo of the satellites, you're going to minimize the amount of reflection that happens. But the question is, if you do that, what does that do to their electronics? Electronics out in space heat up because they're getting constant illumination from the sun and they don't have a lot of really easy ways to radiate that heat back outward. On the International Space Station, when you look at it, you can see the big solar panel arrays, but then there's these other things that look like solar panel arrays, but they're actually cooling panels that get that heat off of the space station. And so you would imagine one of these Starlink satellites is in a very similar orbit dealing with the same kinds of heat problems as the space station. And so I don't know whether painting it black wouldn't make them overheat too much, but now that the astronomy community has freaked out, uh, SpaceX is aware of the problem and they are going to try some new ideas to try and minimize the, the, um, how bright these satellites are. Desiazes. I've heard that Planet Nine could be three light days away. Could we detect it directly or will we need to look for a pattern of stars that blink as the planet passes in front? According to the calculations of Mike Brown and Constantine Badigan, the planet nine, this mysterious object that is out in the outer reaches of the solar system should be visible in the largest telescopes. But the problem is, is that space is really, really big and you don't know where to look with the largest telescopes. And so it's going to take some kind of next generation telescope that is going to be reviewing a large part of the sky at a very sensitive brightness, looking for anything that is moving from night to night. Because it's not enough to just look at a chunk of the sky and planet nine to be in there. You've got to look at that same chunk of the sky the next night and the next night and watch something moving. So it's, it's a challenge. Once something like say the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope finds Planet Nine because it's it's looking at the whole sky every couple of nights. It's going to see things moving. Then you take that data and you follow up with the Hubble Space Telescope or some huge ground telescope and that you can then do figure out a lot more about it specifically. But really until astronomers know where to look they're not going to be able to find it. Edo Deckers. I understand why the fluids in the body redistribute but why is the eye affected? Scientists are still trying to figure out why we have eye problems when we go into microgravity. And this is something that the, the astronauts have all suffered from. When they go to space, their vision is affected. They may require glasses. Uh, and sometimes those changes to their eyesight remain. 
uh, long after they've returned to Earth. So what, what, a, what scientists think might be going on is that essentially every day as we you know, go about our days, we go through a day-night cycle. Some of the time we're standing up and then some of the time we're lying down. And our bodies evolved to deal with this back and forth. But with, with astronauts, it's like they're lying down all the time and they've been able to find that you get these same kinds of vision problems if you just lie down all the time because your eyes aren't getting this change in pressure. And they've come up with some interesting ideas on to maybe fight against this. So one of the ideas, and for just the, the whole situation of fluid redistribution, is that astronauts will wear some kind of vacuum suit on their lower extremity. And if they're going to uh, go for like when it's bedtime they will get into this vacuum suit and that will have a lower pressure on the bot on the bot the bottom of their body and that will cause the fluids to redistribute in a way that is similar to what would happen here on earth and then maybe they could go the other way and they could increase the pressure on the lower part and then that would get the fluids to redistribute and so that might be a partial solution to deal with this whole problem of our fluids not remaining where they're supposed to be uh, while we float around in, in microgravity. Gem drive. Hey Fraser, an alternative to freezing out Venus's atmosphere, would it be possible to introduce reactants into the atmosphere that would form compounds that are solid at that temperature, which would then precipitate and collect on the surface? Yeah, so we've talked about ways to try and improve Venus. Um, and so the idea is that you would create some kind of sunshade that would block the light from getting to Venus and then that would cool down the temperature of Venus and you get to a point where the carbon dioxide would would freeze out of the atmosphere and snow down and then you would just shovel it up and I don't know, do something with it. Well the something, right, is that you would try to bind it up, you try to lock it up. And so you need another kind of atom that binds well with the carbon in the carbon dioxide. And so, for example, one of those is uh, calcium. You can create calcium carbonate or magnesium, magnesium carbonate. You would just need a lot. You need a lot of calcium and a lot of magnesium and you could take that stuff and you could use it to lock up the carbon and then you could, I don't know, dig it underground on Venus and you would have reduced that atmosphere. But it is a monumental process. But if there was asteroids that had large amounts of calcium in them, large amounts of magnesium in them, you could just rain that down into the atmosphere of Venus and try to lock away that, that carbon and form carbonates and you would be able to reduce the atmospheric pressure. But it sounds a lot easier than reality. <laughs> Duck goes quack. If the ISS is hit so badly a compartment is instantly vacuumed, would all the adjacent structures also be vented out? All of the modules on the International Space Station have hatches on them, on both sides. So there's a hatch on, you know, every single module is going to have a hatch on the left and the right, and then on the modules that are beside it, they both have hatches on the left and the right, and so you can open and close the hatches from both sides of every module. And so if there was a uh, impact somewhere on the space station, they could close up all of these hatches and just minimize the amount of atmosphere that leaked out into space until they could come up with a way to, to fix the problem. Uh, but it could still be bad. I mean, if you had an impact go right through a really important part of the station, you wouldn't be able to get from one side of the station to the other without having to go out into space. So um, this is the kind of event that that astronauts train for. They've got emergency procedures to deal with these situations. And what they would most likely do is hop into their Soyuz and come home and then figure out a way to repair the station from there. Torben Bjornhold. Would it be possible with some technology in the future to cancel, filter out light pollution in the larger telescopes, this way to get more useful hours? We actually already have this technology. It's called a narrow band filter. And most amateur astrophotographers are very familiar with this idea of a narrow band filter. One of the biggest ones is like a hydrogen alpha filter, which essentially blocks out all of the light except for a very specific wavelength of light that comes from excited hydrogen. Um, and you can also have a sulfur filter, which only allows the, the light that's coming from sulfur and there's an oxygen filter and there's a bunch of these and so when you see some really beautiful picture astrophotography picture many cases they're using these three separate narrow band filters they they pick one filter 
and they say the hydrogen alpha, they call that red. Then another one, the sulfur one, they call that green. And then another one, the oxygen one, they call that blue. And then they put them together and make a color photograph when really it's these three different wavelengths of light. And the cool thing about that is, is that they pretty much see no light pollution. So you could be in the worst light polluted skies. You could view the sky with one of these narrow band filters and it would be as good as if you were in perfectly dark skies. The problem is I mean, almost as good. Um, and uh, Oceanside Photo and Telescope, they did a great experiment. They went into the middle of Times Square, set up a telescope with narrow band filters and were able to show people sensitive nebulae and, and galaxies and things like that that you wouldn't even think you'd be able to see because you can barely see stars in Times Square. Um, but there's only so far that goes and what if you don't want to look in one of those narrow band filters? What if you want to look in true color? You want to look at all kinds of different places. And so telescopes are built uh, in dark skies so they don't have to decide. They can just do whatever they want. Look at anything. Gustav Babic. Do you think that a space elevator would be a practical way to get into orbit? And if so, is anyone working on it right now? A space elevator on Earth, this idea of running a cable from the surface of the Earth out to geostationary orbit and then attaching it to some counterweight, and then you just use um, elevators to go up and down, is a manufacturing, it's a mega engineering project at the very limits of material science. Like, we don't know of a material that you could use right now that would be strong enough. And maybe like graphene or maybe carbon nanotubes, but none of them built in the kind of scale that we would be required for a space telescope to be built here on Earth. And now that we're entering this era of, of reusable rockets, full two-stage reusable rockets like the, the SpaceX Starship, the need for a space elevator is probably going to go down because these things are going to be relatively inexpensive to take very heavy payloads to space. And then as we move into a manufacturing system out in space where robotic you know, self-replicating robots are mining asteroids and bringing materials and they're manufacturing things in space, the need to launch stuff off of Earth is going to get lower and lower until we get to this point where all we need to launch off of Earth is just people. And those will, will work well in rockets. So, so I, I would be surprised if a space elevator ever gets built. If we ever need large amounts of stuff to be launched from space. We're just in this time right now where we don't have a lot of space infrastructure. And so we're having to make this transition. But give us 100 years. I'll be amazed if rockets launch very often, and mostly just because people want to go from the Earth to space and back again. Paul Schreckenbach. Question about the Fermi Paradox. Would we be able to detect ourselves from across the galaxy based on our radio signals? Across the galaxy, no. And in fact, right now, we wouldn't be able to detect us if we were on Alpha Centauri. Uh, only a directed signal pointed at Earth would be detectable with our current instruments. But that is only true for the next 10 years or so because there's a new mega radio telescope that's getting built called the Square Kilometer Array. And that is like its name, it's going to be one square kilometer of, of resolving power, of uh, observing data. And when it gets built, it will be so sensitive, it will be able to detect Earth uh, airport radio signals to about 50 light years away. In other words, we don't have to be pointing a signal out into space or the the aliens don't need to be pointing a signal out into space for us to be able to detect them. All they need to be able to do is have airports and we would be able to detect them out to a distance of 50 light years. And there's a lot of stars in a 50 light year range. So the era of us being able to hide from the universe is, is over, right? Um, if aliens have been able to build a radio telescope as powerful as, as we're about to, and you would assume if they're very advanced, they will be able to detect an Earth by just by its leaked radio signals out to thousands, but not across the galaxy yet, I think, probably. Who knows? We'll see what the future holds. All right, great questions. Uh, as always, wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it out. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.